the knockout blow from the state's highest court. Late today, the Supreme Judicial Court unanimously ruled that language in the pay raise repeal petition alters the term limits law passed by voters in 1994. The state constitution prohibits such an alteration. Political analyst John Keller joins us now with reaction and a look at what happens now. Karen, what an amazing and emotional story this has been all along. The SJC opinion today focused on narrow technical issues and in keeping with the rancor and dissension that has characterized the pay raise issue from the start, the backers of this initiative petition and legislative leaders are in sharp disagreement over what it really means. As I read this opinion, this is the end of the matter. They got you. <laughs> Not yet they don't. Barbara Anderson of the Coalition for Pay Raise Repeal and Senate President Tom Birmingham, along with House Speaker Finneran, demonstrating that on this hot-button issue, there's no middle ground. I continue to think that substantively the public does not think that a $46,000 salary for year-round legislative work uh, is inappropriate or is excessive. We ought to strive to find a better way. But substantively, I think that uh, we did the right thing with regard to the pay raise. More so than Birmingham, Finneran seemed anxious to reach out to the 88,000 citizens who signed the pay repeal petitions. Uh, and I'm sure that the Senate President and I, as well as all the other members, uh, may consider some type of steps to address the underlying issue uh, once and for all in a fair way that might be able to inspire some reasonable level of confidence from the public. Do you think they get it? Well, the Speaker is the very person who is House Ways and Means Committee Chairman attached the last outrageous 55% pay rate to an appropriation bill, making it referendum-proof by the people. So does he get it? I doubt it very much. Are you relieved that you might not have to share the ballot this fall with Weld's Folly? <laughs> no. Uh, you know, I think it would have been nice. I think people wanted a chance to vote on it. And you know something? They might still get that chance. Today's SJC action was just an advisory opinion. Repeal supporters say they'll forge ahead and await a legal attempt to stop them, at which time they'll get a chance to plead their case before the Supreme Court, something they couldn't do in this advisory phase. But would the court reverse its own unanimous opinion? Well, after all the twists and turns this pay raise story has taken, Karen, nothing would surprise me, nothing. What, if any, is the short-term political fallout here? Well, uh, looking at the two leaders there, Birmingham and Finneran today, I would suggest that it may be fairly toxic. Uh, Bur the two leaders seem to think that the public animus underlying the pay raise repeal movement is ready to dry up and blow away. Both indicated they thought if it did go to a vote this fall, that they might win the vote. That's an eye-opening statement by any measure. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, the term limits law that the SJC, uh, SJC ruled that may have been stepped on by the pay raise repeal, that in itself was an expression of voter distaste. But the has an opinion out against you, the Secretary of State uh, isn't helping too much, the, the Attorney General isn't going to give you the papers. Are you just spinning your wheels here? What's going on? And don't forget the legislature, the whole legislature is against us too, and most of the special interest groups on Beacon Hill and the lobbyists. A little paranoid? Um, no, we actually we have a list of all the people who showed up at the public hearing testifying against the initiative petition for pay raise repeal and assuring the legislature they do everything to help them avoid this, this terrible tragedy. So you think this is a bit of a conspiracy against this uh, pay raise repeal referendum? Well, <laughs> well, there's no doubt that the Beacon Hill system doesn't like our initiative petition because it isn't just a pay raise repeal. We've done that before. This is a whole change in the way business is done on Beacon Hill, including opening up the legislative books, which I think is one of the least popular measures for the legislature. So the whole system's coming down on us, no doubt about that. Did you try to go too far with this referendum? Uh, you try to put too much into the into the bag, and that's what is the downfall so far? No, because um, if we had tried to do too much with it, we wouldn't have been certified by the Attorney General. For people who don't follow closely the initial petition process, the rules are in the Constitution that you have to file your petition by the first Wednesday in August to the Attorney General's office, and they have to certify it that it's okay and that it doesn't do too many things, which they did last August. But the Supreme Court, in a seven to nothing opinion, said wrong this thing is flawed, there are constitutional problems with it, it is not a proper referendum to go before uh, the legislature. Actually, what they said was that it is constitutional, that all the arguments that Senator Birmingham has made about its unconstitutionality and the balance of powers, all those are wrong. And they said that's okay. What they said was the Attorney General should well, not have certified... They didn't get to the constitutional yeah, questions. Yeah, they did. Question really. two was. Question, well, question two was four the through ten they said that they weren't going to, going to look at because 
it was flawed in, in the beginning and therefore they wouldn't even go any further. Yes, but with question two, they basically answered the overall constitutional question and said, we can cut their pay if we want to. We're not doing a six-month session. We don't have to pay them anything if we don't want to. So they made that clear in question two and then questions four through ten were unnecessary. Our problem is with questions one through three, which dealt with should the attorney general have certified the petition last August. They said he shouldn't have. We think he should have, that he did the right thing. Our lawyers certainly agreed. So we thought the petition was okay. We disagree with the opinion of the court, but that isn't the problem right now. Because You've got big problems. I mean, you, it's a long shot that you're going to get this on this November's ballot. Yeah, it is. It is, but we're not going to quit. We're not going to surrender. They're going to have to force us off the ballot. And the only way they can do that is to go to court and have a ruling, a decision from the SJC telling us that we can't go you forward, have which to they go don't have. No, 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 this is incorrect. Well, you, you're not going to get the papers from the Secretary yes, of State, are. are you? Oh, we certainly are. The, the opinion of the Justice How, how can he give you brought. papers with a summary that, that's been declared uh, uh, it wrong? It hasn't. It hasn't. The summary's fine right now. The Attorney General says the summary is wrong. No, no, the Attorney General said that if he gave us the corrective change that we're asking for to address the you're concern of the court. You're not allowed to change the summary, are you? Well, he's saying we're not. The court, in its opinion, implies that we are. We're trying to get the Attorney General to just read our brief on why we think we're allowed to. But whether we can or not, the initiative petition, as it's drafted now, with the summary it has now, must go forward to get the second round of signatures. Secretary Galvin cannot stop this process. The only thing that can stop this process he is He can a refuse to, to give you papers that have a summary that's unconstitutional. I know this is complicated, John, and, and, no. and it's complicated for everybody, but the summary isn't unconstitutional. I mean, it, it's flawed. Summary. No, it isn't. It, it doesn't no. say what's, what supposedly it has to say in order for yes, it to be a it proper does. referendum. The summary says exactly... Not according to the Attorney General. John, truly, truly, the Attorney General is refusing to change the summary because he said then it would be flawed. He's not changing it. So if he doesn't change it, it's the same summary it was all last fall. The summary is then fine. So we then have to go forward to get our signatures, and the Attorney... The, the Attorney General can say if, if he's going to let us change this or not. Whether he says he will let us do it or not, he's already said he won't. Um, and even if we could change it, we still go forward with the initiative petitions until somebody goes to court and the court orders the Secretary of State not to give us the petition. But who ultimately is going to hear this? The SJC would ultimately hear it, but they haven't. They have an opinion, seven to nothing, that it's not proper. They have an opinion, but they do not have a decision, and their opinion was... You think they're going to go against their opinion in the decision? I think we're going to make a solid argument that their opinion is incorrect. I think, I think generally, the opinion was, was simply very, very strange. They've gone farther. Even the Attorney General's office said the first day that this went farther than anything the, the court had ever done before. The Attorney General was right in August. And we were right in August. It seems the to me court you're saying everybody's wrong, right if they agree with you, but if they don't agree with you, they're wrong. You know, last week you were saying the well, Supreme Court was wrong. The Attorney General agreed with us in August. The Attorney General and we were right. Everything was fine until the court, for some reason, expanded its, its interpretation of what you're allowed to do with an initiative petition. And it did it in a way that it had never done it before. This was strange, and we're willing to argue that before the court. We haven't had a chance to argue it before the court because you don't have verbal arguments on a mere It seems to me opinion. that that's what they want to do. It seems to me the court is almost looking for a case to come up so they can, they can make the referendum rules a lot stricter than they are now. Is it? That may be. I really don't know what their motivation is. But they did make it very clear in their opinion that this process does not come to a stop because of this opinion. They put in a footnote. They even issued the opinion again later that day when, when people like Birmingham and Finneran and Galvin and the Attorney General were saying that the petition's dead, it stopped. Well, the court then came out again, reissued the opinion and took out any language that could give anybody the impression the petition was stopped. They have a footnote in there that says the petition goes forward. We don't mean to imply that the petition doesn't go forward. So until they order Galvin not to give us the petitions, he has to give us the petitions or be in violation of the Constitution. When we come back, I want to talk about the backlash that you might have had since this thing has been mm -hmm. stopped. And your whole philosophy it hasn't about... hasn't been stopped. Well, uh, it's been slowed. Slowed. Would you agree to that? At least slow. It's been slowed. Yes. And your whole philosophy about the pay raise. Right. That you're a long shot to get it on this November's ballot. But if it's not on this November's ballot, you're back again the next time there's an election in Massachusetts on the pay raise, right? We're back with that or with something else. But we have other plans for this fall's ballot, too, our, our you know, option B, which we will... Go, go on with if uh, if something goes wrong with you the You want to talk to us now about uh, option B? No, because that would be something that would be voted on by our coalition, the Coalition for Pay Raise Repeal, and all the members of the coalition would have to vote Who on makes it. it uh, I think people associate the Pay Raise Repeal with you, the Citizens for Limited Taxation, but you're only part of other groups That's right. under the umbrella of the Pay Raise yes, Repeal Yes, we're coalition. part of a coalition that is run by Chip Ford, who's the chairman of the coalition. It includes limits that did term limits. 
It includes Dominic Pizzotto's Local 26, the Hotel Workers Union. It includes United We Stand, um, Massachusetts version. Now, personally, I know you can't speak for everybody in that coalition, but personally, are you dead set against any kind of a pay raise for the lawmakers? 160 members of the House and 40 members of the Senate? Um, set or dead set? Um, when they first did it, whether I'm set or not against it, we would not have gone, any of us, would not have gone to all this trouble to repeal a pay raise that was reasonable, that was done for the next sitting legislature, that wasn't done in a lame duck session, that wasn't 55%. So if they had simply done a reasonable pay raise, made it apply to the next legislature the way Congress has to make it apply to the next Congress, and if they had done it with respect for the voters, had not had it done in three days, hadn't waited for a lame duck session if they were safely reelected, we would absolutely not have repealed the pay raise. Absolutely not. You but that doesn't mean we think they should be getting paid what they're getting paid. We don't. We think they should be citizen legislators working only through June the way they do in most other states, 42 well, other states. Well, some of the bigger states get comparable pay. No, no. No, Texas is much bigger than we are. They get $7,200. Well, North New York, Carolina New York is, is bigger and they get 54000 And look at the condition New York is in. Yeah. But they're usually out by the end of July, too. No other legislature stays in year-round the way our legislature always has, waiting till the lame duck sessions or the holiday season to get its, its legislation done, pretending to be full-time, when in fact, they really only legislate for eight weeks out of the year, just like other states do. Then they have a couple Would months of public Would you want to see the hearings? governor sitting with, without the legislative checks and balances? That seems to be a constitutional question, too. No, it isn't. The court made it clear that none of those constitutional problems were a concern to them. But, of course, the governor has to govern all year. The executive branch has to execute all year. The judicial branch judiciates all year. But the legislative branch doesn't have to make laws all year. In other states, they're out in eight weeks. They're through in, in April, June at the latest, and then they go home, and they live as citizens with their laws that they're making. They live in their communities. They relate to the people instead of the way they do on Beacon Hill to each other. I mean, in other states, it would so be who unthinkable. Would, uh, who would we be getting as legislators then? You might be getting a lot of retired people, students getting out of school, say, hey, this is a pretty good first job. Uh, Surprisingly, Johnny, we've done a lot of research on this, and that's what I would originally have thought it too. Mm -hmm. That would be retired people and, and just lawyers and real estate people. The variety in other states of people who work with the legislature is just astonishing. There's this huge variety of people, plumbers, electricians, teachers, pr professors, small businessmen, a lot of health care workers, policemen, firemen. They come in, they consider it a part-time job, they legislate sometimes a couple days a week only, and then they go home, or they just do a tight, concentrated session, and then they get out. And in these other states, like our competing states, North Carolina, um, Texas, other high-tech states, they're, they're gone. They're just out. Virginia, ha they left who, last who, month. Who's gone and who's out? Right. William Bolger and Charles Flaherty. We have brand new leadership in both houses. Uh, and in the press conference the other day that, that uh, Finneran in Birmingham uh, held right mm. after this court decision, uh, court opinion came out, um, they, Finneran started talking like one of their objections is to change the whole process and how a pay raise should come about. And, and it, it was a public relations fiasco for the legislature, left a bad taste in everyone's mouth. Is there a proper way in your mind that sure. it should be and done? it's in our petition. It's in our petition. And, and they could have done it themselves at any time. This thing that Birmingham keeps saying that we have to vote on our pay rates, that is simply untrue. They don't. They can set up a determinant, could be inflation, could be almost anything, that gives them an automatic pay increase. The trouble is when they do it, they do something silly like tying it into state workers' salaries, which they vote on, and you'd end up ending increasing everybody's pay for them to get a pay raise. What our petition does is it gives them, and once this pay raise goes into effect, or this pay raise repeal, it gives them an automatic increase each year based upon median family income in Massachusetts. So if their constituents are doing well, the economy is doing well, if they don't totally screw up the economy the way they did in the 80s, when the personal and median family income went down 1%, they would have gotten a pay cut. If they do a pretty good job, they would get a pay increase. This year, for instance, they would have gotten a 9% pay increase because median family income went up. They would have gotten a lot more than the, over the years that, that they didn't sure. touch the pay raise That's at right. all. If it had been on to That's a cost of living right. increase, they'd get, be getting a lot more but than $46,000 now. That's right, but they got too greedy. Every time they try to do a pay raise, they try to, to jump ahead. 37% was the last one. This one's 55%. If they had simply back in 1983, the last time they did a pay raise and tied it into judges' pay so we couldn't repeal it, if they had simply at that point put in the determinants that every year median family income, but they don't want median family income, they want to do better, they want more, they think they're worth more, and we've seen from the way they behave lately that they really aren't. You've collected over 80,000 signatures uh, for this particular referendum. How, what are you hearing back since the, uh, the ju justices came out with their opinion last week? Um, mostly our members are calling up saying, don't even think of quitting, but we're also getting people who call and say, we don't agree with you on the pay raise, but we'll help you get signatures for the second round. If, but if I ask you, you count numbers pretty well, you know what the odds are pretty well, you're a long shot now. Well, definitely a long shot because 
um, because the Attorney General wouldn't even listen to our arguments. He wasn't even interested in what 88,000 people wanted him to read when we turned in our brief yesterday. He made his decision before we even had a chance to show him our arguments or ask him what it was we wanted to ask him. So he's prejudiced against him. We don't have a chance with him, though we're going to court. Um, this but we will get the signatures, but the court, we'd have to convince the court that their opinion was incorrect. I think it was. I think we have a shot.